Hello Crew World, welcome to A Site for Sore Minds. My name is Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant a forensic psychiatrist. So today I'm gonna to talk about Noel Clark, who is a very well-known, very well-established British uh, film director and producer and actor. And very recently there's been a string of sexual allegations against him, about 20 altogether, I believe. So I'm gonna talk about his background, I'm gonna talk about some of the specific allegations, but because I'm a psychiatrist, I'm gonna delve into the interesting psychological aspects. So I'm going to talk about why it's difficult for some people who are victims of, of sexual assaults to come out, and why it might have taken this long for these allegations to have come out against Noel Clark. And I'm also gonna talk a bit about the psychiatric and the psychological uh, consequences of being sexually assaulted and to do that I'm going to draw on my experience as a psychiatrist. Uh, okay so let's get started. First of all when we talk about Noel Clark's background he was born on the 6th of December 1975 which makes him 45 years old and both of his parents were from Trinidad. His mother was a part-time nurse and a part-time librarian and his father was a carpenter. They divorced shortly after Clark was born. And he grew up in quite harsh surroundings, I would say. So he grew up in a council estate in Ladbrook Grove. And he actually worked as a personal trainer before he went through the whole route of, of uh, acting in cinematography. And currently he is married and he has three children. So to give you a kind of an overview of the allegations, the Guardian newspaper, so for our foreign cousins, uh, not from the UK, The Guardian's quite a, a well-known, respected, kind of left-wing newspaper. They said they made these allegations against Clark on the 29th of April, 2021, so very recently. And apparently 20 different women have come out and made allegations. I'll go into the details of some of those later. I should point out that he's not been criminally charged yet, and I don't think there's been a police investigation yet. I think it's likely that there will be. And also that he himself denies these charges. So I think in terms of balance, I should mention that. He has admitted one of the allegations, which is about making sexual comments to one woman, but he's denied all the rest of them. As a consultant forensic psychiatrist, I'm not in the business of talking about whether somebody's guilty or not guilty. In fact, when I give evidence in, in um, criminal trials, anything from murder, arson, sexual assault, I'm not allowed to say whether I think somebody's guilty or not guilty, because it kind of sways uh, it can sway the judge or the jury in the evidence I give. I'm only allowed to comment on the mental health issues. But having said all that, I mean, it's 20 allegations, so uh, that's a large number. It, it doesn't look good, does it? And even if the charges are not proved or if he's found innocent, I think it's fair to say that this will damage his reputation in the long run. So Clark is quite prolific. He's done many different films. The ones that he's probably most well known for are a trilogy, which are Kid Adulthood, Adulthood and Brotherhood, which were made in 2006, 2008, 2016. Uh, I think I've seen the first two of those. I remember them being, being very good, actually. Um, they, it was a few years ago. And he's also got his own production company called Unstoppable, and he's made about 10 films through that. And he's also made some series, some of which are quite well known. So there's Bulletproof, there's The Drowning. And I think what he's respected for, or was respected for, is that they're very sort of realistic and they're gritty because he came from humble beginnings. You know, he lived that life. He grew up on a council estate. And so he's risen through the ranks and I think he gave a voice and some representation for people who come from these kind of uh, quite meagre, minimalistic backgrounds and also people who are from ethnic minorities. And he's kind of risen through the ranks. Now he sits on the BAFTA Film Committee and he's also a formal mentor for ITV, which is like a huge channel in the UK. So I'm going to go through some of the allegations now. I'm not gonna go through all of them because otherwise the video would just be too long, but I'm just gonna give you like an overview of the kind of uh, behaviors and acts that he's alleged to have made. Uh, all of what I'm about to say is in the public domain, by the way. So there's an actress called Johanna James, who came out in 2017 saying that she auditioned for a role in Brotherhood. And she was only 23 at the time, she was quite young and naive. And she was asked to do the audition naked by Noel Clark. And obviously she was uncomfortable about this. 
and she had some contact via her agent and she was told that apparently it was, it was to make sure that she was comfortable enough to do it during the actual filming, which I presume to mean that there were nude scenes in the, in the film that she had to do. And so she reluctantly agreed, but she was guaranteed that it wouldn't be filmed. And apparently Noel Clark is alleged to have filmed her covertly, kept the footage, obviously very creepy, and then shown other people. So other people, other production producers have come forward saying that he's shown them this footage. Just to quickly mention another allegation, there was a Norwegian film maker called Sin Selvit, and she worked with Noel Clark together. And in July 2015, a few of them went to this uh, UFC MMA show in Glasgow, and apparently the after party, he's alleged to have slapped her bum, which made her feel quite uncomfortable. And then days later, they were sending emails and communications about working together. And Clark is alleged to have sent a, uh, I'm trying to think if there's a polite way of saying this, there isn't a dick pic to her via Snapchat which apparently she actually showed The Guardian, so it sounds like there is some physical evidence. And in terms of the other allegations, there was lots of touching and kissing and grabbing and groping, sometimes when Noel Clark was alone with young actresses, sometimes in front of other people, and he would do things allegedly like set up meetings with actresses to help them further their career in hotels and then heavily insinuate that he expected sex in return. There was another incident that I read about at some uh, one of his production team, I believe, it was at an after party and she was doing the splits and Clark is alleged to have taken like quite intimate photos uh, without her knowledge while this was happening and then everybody was like laughing at them around the office a couple of days later. Again, I should say that he denies these allegations. Some of the actresses that have come out, uh, not just actresses, but some of the female victims in general have gone public and some of them have asked to remain anonymous when they approached The Guardian. So I think that begs the question, why have all these allegations come out now? And I think the main reason is because Noel Clark received a BAFTA award on the 10th of April, 2021. So for those who don't know, BAFTA is the British Academy of Film and TV Arts Award. So it's kind of like the spottier, fat, younger brother of the Oscars, if you want to think of it like that. And about two weeks before then, apparently BAFTA had received a number of anonymous emails with these allegations, uh, but there was no actual proof. So their kind of side of the story is, is that it was, it was appropriate to give him the award, although a lot of people have come out and said that just the allegations in themselves should have made them suspicious and they, they shouldn't have given him the award. But either way, a lot of people noticed that on the night when he was on the stage, he looked really nervous and he knew about these allegations, so that that could have been one of the reasons. So I think a lot, of the, a lot of his victims felt it was particularly unfair that he was being given all these awards, given what he did, so that was kind of their, they were moved, that was their inspiration to come out and tell everybody publicly about what he allegedly did. So I think this leads to quite an interesting sort of wider question, which is this, why are some people reluctant to report sexual abuse when they're victims? I think there's lots of reasons and most of them are kind of connected and intertwined. So firstly, there's a fear of like reprisal or revenge, especially if they're not believed by people. And also they might need to continue a relationship with that person. So often it's like a, a relative or a family friend or like a work colleague. So specifically in Noel Clark's case, I'm sure a lot of his victims were worried that if they weren't believed they're still in the film industry and they would probably have to run into Noel Clark himself or friends and colleagues. And also often there might be a lack of proof. So unless like there's physical violence or forced sexual intercourse, it's actually quite hard to have physical evidence. So that sort of ties into not being believed, which is another major factor, not being believed by anybody, not being believed by the police, especially if you've got somebody who's quite well-renowned in their field. And also I think just a fear of being labeled. So you're now a victim, your family and your friends know about it, and it might be quite embarrassing. And even, even if it's completely not your fault, and even if people are generally sympathetic, you still become that victim, that's, that's how you're labelled, that's how you're known in the community, you'll be that woman or man, although obviously by far the majority of victims are women, but you'll become that person that that thing happened to. I think another area that's a bit more contentious and is a bit harder to talk about and is a bit uncomfortable is that in some cases it's, it's hard for people, when I say people I mean the perpetrator, the victim, 
members of the public, the police, everybody, to know exactly where the line has been crossed and where consent has been kind of overlooked. So one extreme example would be if somebody is kind of raped by a stranger at knife point, say, then that's really obvious, it's very clear. But there's also a kind of grayer area where there has been consent to a degree. So examples that spring to my mind would be um, Aziz Ansari. So in January 2018, I believe, an allegation by a lady called Grace came out against him uh, being quite sort of persuasive and forceful during a date. And some people thought that was clearly a sexual assault and some people, and I'm not talking about me, I'm just saying some people thought that it was more like he it was just a sloppy attempt and he misread some cues and uh, like a, a line hadn't been crossed. Another example would be Louis CK. So in November 2017, I think five different women came out and accused, made accusations of him uh, openly masturbating in front of them, asking for permission and then masturbating. And some people thought it was just a sloppy kind of tragic way of him expressing his sexuality, whereas again, some people counted that as sexual assault. So my point is, is that it's not always obvious and it does polarize people. Now, I just wanna make it absolutely crystal clear that I'm not making any moral judgments. And I mean, I hope it goes without saying, obviously no means no, but this is YouTube and the haters gonna hate. I'm just pointing out that for many people, there's a spectrum and it's hard to know exactly where things lie on that spectrum, okay? But as I say, this is YouTube, so trolls, do your best. So going back to Clark, I think because he was so well respected and so well renowned and successful in his field, I'm sure some of his victims would have felt intimidated. They must have felt that uh, they had to kind of go along with what he was suggesting if the allegations are true and he potentially could have ruined their careers. And I think the other issue is that sometimes, I, I don't know how, to what degree this happened in Noel Clark's case, but for other celebrities that have committed sexual assault, sometimes it's normalized by other people in the industry. So a good example of that would be Jimmy Savile, who was a prolific, uh, horrific, repeat sexual offender, but apparently a lot of people in the industry either ignored it or allowed it, which I'm sure makes it much harder for the victims to come out. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about something else. I wanted to make at least part of this video something that's kind of unique to me. So I'm a forensic psychiatrist. I assess mentally disordered offenders for a living, so you don't have to. So I work in prisons and in courts and in special secure units. I've seen many criminal cases for a range of offenses, including people that have perpetrated sexual assaults and people who are victims of sexual assaults. So in particular, I take on civil court cases as well as criminal cases and I look at the psychiatric consequences of people who have been previously sexually abused. I talk about a whole range of different topics on this channel, psychiatric illnesses, diagnoses, high profile criminal cases of people who had mental illnesses. I'm kind of in the middle of doing a series about infamous Broadmoor patients. There's something for everybody on this channel, so you should check it out. So quite recently, I did a series of, actually, sorry, it wasn't recently, it was a few years ago. I, I did a series of professional assessments on victims of one particular man who is a headmaster who sexually abused dozens of children in the 70s. And I assessed some of the victims who are obviously now grown men in their 50s. I thought back carefully, and I'm not going to name who the perpetrator was, not because I care about him, uh, but, because I think it would be a bit unfair on the victims uh, if they were to watch this video, it might bring up some uncomfortable memories. So out of respect for them, I'm not going to mention it. But I learned a lot from doing all these assessments and I was quite taken aback about the differences of the psychiatric and the psychological consequences that, um, that the, these people had who were victims of sexual abuse because this, the abuse was actually quite similar, but some of the diagnoses and consequences down the line were actually quite different. So this man, this headmaster, what he would do is he would prey and groom on young boys and he would also kind of befriend their parents as well. And he was well respected in the community so nobody really realised what he was doing. He'd pick out children that he believed were sort of special and he would invite them into his office um, and he would commit sexual acts with them and make them perform sexual acts with him. And he was prolific. I mean, he did this, this you know, very, very regularly for a number of children. I imagine he got emboldened because he wasn't caught for so many years and it just, it was just uh, completely horrific. In terms of the psychiatric assessments I did, the vast majority of people, as you would expect, 
developed post-traumatic stress disorder. So they would have fairly typical symptoms like flashbacks of the abuse, um, hypervigilance, which are like constantly being on edge and being easily anxious and avoidance behaviors. So they would avoid scenarios that reminded them. So for example, one of the men just, just hated being inside a school. So he had kids and he would avoid parents evening, for example, because being inside that environment would trigger the previous memories and the previous flashback. What was interesting was that uh, the, the, the degree of functioning that these men had was very different. So on one end of the spectrum, I remember assessing a man whose life was just messed up. So he was constantly fighting. He was very uh, sexually promiscuous in his teens and his twenties. He became a regular offender. He got into fights quite regularly. He would drink quite heavily. It kind of consumed his life and it ruined his life. On the other hand, on the other end of the spectrum, I met a man who didn't have PTSD and the abuse hadn't really had that much of a, of a huge impact on him compared to the others. So he developed dysthymia, which is like a chronic low mood. It's not quite severe enough to be depression, uh, but his level of functioning was fine. He, you know, he held down a quite a high managerial job. He enjoyed family life. So my point is, is it affects different people to different degrees. And again, just to be absolutely clear, I'm not talking about the morality of sexually offending, I'm talking about the psychiatric consequences. And I can speak about that with some authority because I formally assess people for the court on this very matter. So again, YouTube trolls, leave me alone. So to conclude my kind of final thoughts and reflections, this case against Noel Clark is very damning. If the allegations are true, then somebody who's kind of respected for making gritty films, who've represented people from ethnicities, who's kind of made it from quite humble beginnings, uh, he is going to be trashed. I would highlight that he has categorically denied these claims. Uh, I hope it's investigated, I'm sure it will be. It does sound like there might be some physical evidence against him, such as footage on and uh, dick pics. So I think that it's likely that it will come to a head and I really hope justice is served. I do think this seems to be happening increasingly more that people are coming out against celebrities and talking about sexual abuse. And obviously that's a good thing. It's a good thing that people feel emboldened and feel that they will be believed. And I think that when people come out, it gives other people who are victims the courage to come out and speak their own stories and their own truths. I don't think it's necessarily happening more, the sexual abuse, I think just the allegations are coming out more, which I think is a good thing. So I hope in this video you found it interesting. I hope you learned a little bit about Noel Clark and the allegations, but also I hope that I've taught you something about the psychiatry behind it all, specifically why some victims struggle to come uh, and report their experiences to the police, and also the differences between psychiatric and psychological consequences on people. Okay, I've done enough talking. Subscribe to my channel, it's Psych for Sore Minds. It's got loads of good content. It's got a bit of everything for everybody. Until next time, stay euthymic and please remember, I love you.